Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Theo Kitsos. Uh, a few things uh, briefly about myself. I'm a Greek national. I work in Moscow as a vice president for human resources for one of the biggest companies uh, around the world, which is Unilever. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm responsible for the human resource department uh, in, in uh, the geography, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Be Bel Belarus, and I'm uh, based in, in Moscow. Uh, at the outset, first of all, thanks for coming forward. Uh, we'll have the chance to really, after a short uh, introduction, to interact. And this is the part of, uh, of the day that I value the most. It's not uh, the presentation that I give, but also the ability that you will have to ask questions, and uh, I will answer them to the best of my uh, abilities. Today, I would like to talk to you about the leadership and uh, how leadership is in the 21st century and how leadership is different in the 20th century and, and uh, in the century that we live today. In my career, I have faced often a lot of different questions on leadership. How do we develop leaders? How can be a leader? Who cannot be a leader? And many other things. And I would like to share my knowledge and experience on the issue today with you. I will begin with uh, who the leader is and what leaders actually do. I would say that effective leaders are distinguished uh, uh, from ordinary people by the particular nature and their mentality. I often call them working contradictions for their ability to cope with paradoxes and combine the incompatible. They know how to balance short-term and long-term prospects, action and reflection, optimism and realism, discipline and freedom, creative and systematic thinking, technical and classic knowledge, and much more. If you look at leadership in general, the leaders cope with three groups of issues. First is the strategic management, working with teams and, of course, in generally with people. And the third is the operational management. Combining these three aspects of leadership helps the leader move his and team uh, forward to successfully cope with uncertainty, make key decisions and help his colleagues believe in ideas and embody them in practice. Besides, a contemporary leader, to some extent, performs the functions of a manager, but does not stop there. Thus, leadership includes all these three areas, but in different proportions. And if you look at certain leaders, each one of them has his own path to leadership and his own or her own formula for success. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the manager and the leader are two different people and they perform two different roles. And the motto of the leader is more like a slogan like of exceeding expectations. When a leader conceives an idea or receives a task from his or her superior, his or her action and motivation is to really help do much more than a manager does. It doesn't stop to the line, it goes beyond the line. For a leader, it is very important to know on new tasks and projects and develop uh, solutions to help cope with emerging challenges. While the manager is busy with operational issues and their routine work uh, most of the time, he or she keeps the company at the level of the leader brought it to. The manager ensures that the company works, the tasks are solved, and solved efficiently. She or he helps people which in the charge of to allocate their time and resources efficiently. While the leader creates the vision and principles of teamwork, shares these principles and makes people follow him. She, he, the leader helps the company <coughs> to cope with uncertainty and make sure the right thing is done. The leader works more for the future, more for the outstanding results, goes beyond the guidelines and the call of duty. Leadership has evolved between the two centuries that we, we lived. The challenges coming in the, within the 21st century requires leaders to be more strategic and apply breakthrough thinking to change, to lead, not to stay, or to follow. Sustainability of the growth also became a turning point in leaders' attention. Employees play a key 
are all being enabler of that. To have right people in the team, the business leader needs to invest his, and time, his or her time into the team, into the people. Coaching, motivation, people development are the areas where leaders act most of the time. In response, they gain the talent ready to match the ambition, to manage the team ambition, to manage their own personal ambition. Meanwhile, there are certain management practices which leaders still apply not to miss the control and ensure that the processes go right. It's part of the leadership task. While in the 20th century, more attention was paid to the control issues, resources allocation, budgeting, solving current problems, the role of the leader has, has emerged. The leaders now have started to control fewer things and spend more time in inspiring people, tackling with strategic issues, long-term challenges. Thus, it changes the structure of the company itself. The companies do different things today versus what they used to do in previous times. The structure of the company, therefore, is changing, and the position of the leader is different from the 21st century than it was in the 20th. First of all, this is because people themselves who come into the organization are changing, and this is people like you, who in a couple of years you will hit the employment arena. People, just like yourselves, become more proactive, more educated. The style of leadership and structure has to change in order to adapt to the requirements of the new generation. A new understanding of the organizational structure and share of the responsibility is also emerging. Here we see that in the 20th century, there was a hierarchical structure of the company, where now things have evolved. People in certain positions had, in fact, a formal leadership. They had power, which they used to monitor and influence the employees, their behavior, and, of course, their results. Thus, the motivation was based on the method of carrot and stick. In the 21st century we live, the basis of leadership is motivation. It is based on the relationships. Relationships is a critical point of whatever you do. You have to build the relationships with your boss, with your subordinate, with your peers, with the environment in general. This is where the leaders base their authority and confidence to their employees, but to the entire work environment. It is like a shadow leadership when the leader allows her, his or her team to take initiative. The leader herself or himself is, a, is not already at the top position, but is behind helping the team, steering the team, and directing the team, while the team is ready to move by itself. The enable for this is a trust that leader gives to the team. It drives people to take responsibility for their work and work for the team. It affects people's behaviors and yields results. New leaders seek their task in creating conditions for the team management, not simply setting the goals. They create conditions in which other people are willing and able to manage. In fact, the shadow management is very difficult. This rewards a great deal of responsibility and serious decisions. The leader must determine who should be in the team and who should not be in the team. It is necessary to formulate the fundamental values that guide people to develop their abilities of subordinates to best deliver the work, to settle the inevitable conflicts, for example, to decide when and whom to support, when to say a decisive no, when to let things take their course, and when to give a clear action plan. In such an organization, all are equally talented and everyone at some point has an equal right to lead others. Everybody can be a leader. If you look at the Russian reality, we have great opportunities for changes. Let us start with the managers in Russia. For a very long time, people had seen the authoritarian methods, starting to believe this is the only way the leader can manage, the leader of the 20th century. In recent past, if you ask people to brainstorm and contribute to a decision-making, it would shock, shock them. It would make them not feel engaged. Moreover, they would start to think their leader can't take decision of his or her own. 
Nowadays, our managers need to mitigate that and turn on the leadership and really involve others, as this is the tool to tackle today's challenges in an ever-changing world. People have become accustomed to this system, but nothing can substitute for freedom and independence. If you want to have someone responsible and efficient, set him or her free. Employees who have a complicated motivation. Employees also have a complicated motivation. They may be eager to show their talent, but for some, it is also comfortable to stay with a limited level of responsibility. They do not go beyond the call of duty. Russia has unique challenges. It took 20 years to shift the mentality from a communism-driven system to a more participative one with more openness, freedom, opportunities, and entrepreneurship. Yet the years to come will see more change as the requirements differentiate at a global but also at a national level. The reality is that changes are indeed happening. Well-educated Russians, especially in big cities, learn and develop very fast. As a consequence, they keep on maturing. The 21st century generation has a different outlook as they start working. Personally, I believe a lot in this generation of Russians and what they will achieve. In fact, the transition from the leadership of the 20th century to the leadership of the 21st century in practice proved to be quite difficult not only for Russia, but worldwide. And yet, very few organizations have successfully coped with it. If we look at the statistics, by and large, with this change of use on leadership in the 21st century, many companies lack good leaders. They don't have good leaders. Yes, there are leaders who adhere to the management style of the 20th century and show certain progress. They make adaptations. But overall, companies have difficulty in finding leaders who could lead them in success in today's changing and turbulent conditions. And in changing conditions, the leaders who came from the past are not always able to cope with the current situation. Because in leadership, context is very important. Context is the cultural difference and peculiarity in which the company operates, and that is the industry, and the specifics of the industry, and the specifics of the environment. All these details are important. That is why even good leaders who can inspire the team do not always cope with the difficulties they face. Therefore, the wrong action can lead to large losses for the company just because the team will not come when needed. The consequences could be enormous if a leader makes a mistake in his or her understanding of what is happening and how to act or how to react. New leaders who will become good leaders and great leaders in the future are worth the money to invest. You should invest in them by not only paying salary but also giving them the chance to learn and develop by making mistakes and trying something new. By providing a chance to manage and lead. And this is a simple rule. It is important to give them the opportunity to manage, take responsibility, and learn from their mistakes, even <clears throat> they do not know how to do it correctly. This growth of a leader takes place in actual conditions. And to really grow up within the organization, a leader should be allowed to make mistakes. The cost of a poor or not, uh, or not good enough leadership sometimes accounts for several million, irrespective of the currency. This includes the wrong business decisions and missed opportunities, as well as direct damages caused by the actions of the leaders. Therefore, in order to have good leaders within the company, companies need to pay much more attention to the resource they have to meet these challenges. If you look at the statistics of the research conducted by Leadership Management International Company, the figures are saying that the management in the companies and the leadership in the companies are not good as they would like it to be. The companies themselves admit that they have a leadership gap. <clears throat> not all the employees work in teams with strong leaders. Not all leaders cope with implementing the strategy and bringing his or her team to some results. Not all the changes are successful. Moreover, more than 75 of the companies that they are not sure that they will be able to find and properly develop these leaders, create a workable program to develop leaders in order to solve these problems in the future. And what they really now need now is a new program of leadership development. 
And it is necessary not only for Unilever, which I represent today, but also for other large companies. Let's have a look what we did uh, in Unilever. Unilever is a company that aspires to be a market leader, and therefore we must have the best leaders. We continuously improve the products to provide a higher value for our consumers. Develop new technology to stay on top of marketing practices and enable all this by the very best talent that we can find and groom. Win it is just, no, not just a word. It is in all aspects what we'll try to do, what we actually do. Win with our people and brands in the marketplace, continuously improving our business and commitment. But we're also cautious about how we do all that. The set of behavioral competencies best fitting our values, targets, and efficiency are simply called the standards of leadership. Here are our standards. First, consumer and customer focus, which means our orientation towards clients and people just like you. When you think what an ice cream to choose, we try and ensure that you get the tastier ice cream that you will ever find. Second, growth mindset is showing what we, we do not stay on and what we have achieved in the past, but we always aspire to move forward. Third, accountability and responsibility claims that our commitment will be delivered. What I claim that I will do, I always do. As I promised to you, I was going to be here today, here I am. Bias for action, enable us to move faster, take efficient decision quickly. And fifth, but perhaps the most important, build talent and teams, which is the fundamental source of our long-term growth and success. You can see how these standards came to action in an example called as Future Leaders Program. This program is based on the concept of a corporate university and helps its employee to, to try himself or herself as a leader. We believe that these employees, those employees who truly believe in themselves, who feel they have the potential, can become actually true leaders. This program provides a unique opportunity for development. In Unilever, we believe that everyone could be a leader, and we believe that leadership is not a position. It is a way of thinking, a belief. The way you show yourself, your behavior. We understand that most valuable resource is people. And they are the leaders who lead the company to success for the short term, medium term, but also the long term. Thus, we pay attention to how we teach our future leaders, how we support our own staff. We try to use the newest technologies of teaching, use the balanced approach, rotate them across four functions, and put a lot of resources so that our employees have ample opportunities to prove themselves and get off the first positions. We help people become better and reach their true potential. Our program allows young talent to experience more in, uh, more in two years than you ever thought possible. You will get a real job from day one focused on building leadership capability and accelerating development. The program involves a number of job rotations, real roles with real responsibilities that will provide a fantastic insight into how the organization works. The program will also give you a bigger picture. Wherever you are based, you will quickly begin to see how the functions operate closely together. And to help you better understand that interaction, you will often work as part of cross-functional teams. You will also get involved at every level. For example, from working on the factory floor to spending time in the supermarket. As you move on, your placements get more challenging. That can mean managing larger budgets, bigger brands, and more people. We will support you every step on the way, but much of your progress, it's up to you. As well as learning the job, you will have the access to many structured courses, including in some areas those which lead to professional qualifications. You will need to be focused and ambitious to get, to, and ambitious to get where you want, identifying opportunities and taking responsibility for your own development. 
To keep the long story short, I would just give you a figure. More than 40% of current Unilever leaders are those who participated in our foundation program, the Unilever Future Leader programs, and this number grows every year. And I will talk a little bit about myself without referring to my text uh, speech uh, any longer. I will explain my life story, my professional life story. So as I said in the beginning, uh, I'm a Greek national. Um, I studied in the economics in the University of Athens, Greece, and then I moved to the United States where I got an MBA in finance. I came back to my home country and after serving in the military, which was compu it's compulsory in, in Greece, um, I applied for three companies, I got three offers, and I decided to join Unilever. I joined Unilever for three reasons. First of all, it, was an, it is an international company. Second, it had fantastic products that we were using as a family every day. And third, it was renowned, famous, for the quality of the people, the quality of the teachers beyond my education uh, that I was uh, receiving up to that point. I joined uh, the Future Leaders program uh, in, in Unilever Greece in 1992 uh, in the procurement department. And a year down the road, uh, I was called by the HR director, my equivalent number uh, these days, uh, and said, who said to me, would you like to, to move to HR? And I must admit, I was intimidated by him, and I said, no problem. But then I started having doubts about that, when I said yes. About three months later on, I decided that's, that's what I wanted to do long term in my life. So the dichotomy between business and people, it's a very powerful one. It's a sweet spot, at least for me. I stayed in Unilever Greece for about five and a half years, including my traineeship. Uh, and in 1997, I moved uh, in the United Arab Emirates, based in Dubai, as personnel manager for five countries. Two years down the road, I was asked to move to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, as the management development manager, looking for recruitment, training, and management development, what we call today talent management, uh, in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And a year down the road, I must have been, I must have been doing some, something good because I, I was promoted to the position of the vice president HR for a cluster company. Actually, I was responsible for eight countries. I stayed in that role for about two and a half years and then I was moved to Rotterdam in one of the two head offices of Unilever. Unilever has globally two head offices, one in London and one in Rotterdam as Vice President for Learning and Organizational Development. That, that title sounds very big. Perhaps I can explain to you later on if you're interested to what, what it means and what I, what, what I was doing. And then, at a point of time, family circumstances made me resign from Unilever. I left Unilever and I came back to my home country as a, vice pre as a, a general manager for HR and organization in the largest Greek corporation. About two and a half years down the road, I was called again by Unilever. I left as a, what we call, a regretted uh, loss. Unilever wanted to keep me, but the family circumstances called me, called me back. And they said to me, we have a role for you in London. Would you ever consider? I said, oh my gosh, I just came back to Greece. My wife will kill me. <laughs> and um, I said, I said to Unilever, look, right now it's, it's an impossible thing for me to move out of, of uh, the home country. They said, no worries about that. Um, we'll give you the opportunity to work for Mathis, but doing a role, a role in London. I said, how is that possible? He said, your team will be based in London and you will have to travel. So I started in about 2007 when I joined back Unilever to start practicing agile working. So traveling, a lot of traveling, and managing a team which was dispersed around the world. That was another difficult leadership challenge. 
uh, which requires a fundamentally different way of working. You have to connect people, not by presence, by using electronic media. In the beginning, it was a very big challenge for me. I managed to really get it through. And when I was about to complete two years in my role, uh, Unilever convinced me to bring my family to London. When my wife at that point of time seeing me traveling every week to London, four hours flight, two hours a week, she said, okay, let's, let's, let's do it. So we all moved as a family back to, to uh, we moved as a family to UK. And about nine months down the road, so actually about 18 months for, from today, um, somebody called me and said, look, we have an opportunity for you in Moscow. Would you ever consider? So I said, I have to ask my wife again. <laughs> we just moved. We just moved. And um, we came for a pilot visit uh, sometime in June 2010. My wife and, and daughter loved it here. And since August 2010, I'm, I'm based here. So the summary of that is that I have worked in many countries. Actually, Unilever gave me the opportunity to work in different countries, associate myself with different cultures. And you know, every culture is different. Not all people are the same. Just like our fingers, they don't have the same length. And you have to adapt. That's how you learn. I talked about the circumstances which change. The circumstances change every day. You have to adapt your style and your behaviors based on the, what you have in front of you. And that is called this leadership. This is one form of leadership. Leading people of diverse backgrounds going beyond the call of duty. Some people ask me, okay, now we get it, why you joined Unilever in the first place, but why you joined Unilever for the second time? And I, I respond to them for exactly the same reasons I joined Unilever in the first place. I, have, I had the experience to work for other organizations, and I came back because Unilever is an international company, it has best quality of people and best quality of brands. And at this point of time, I will stop it, because I can go on f forever. But as I said in the beginning, I value more the interaction that we're going to have, so I can learn from you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who will be the brave one to ask the question first? My Russian is also. Как вы считаете, какой тип лидерства для России наиболее приемлемый? Авторитарный строй там или демократический? Как вот Дмитрий Пис выбирает для России? Адорт, Адорт, вот его работа. I'm a person who works in business. And uh, I'm learning every day what it takes to lead people. My personal style is a very democratic one. I let people free. Because if I let people free, I can have back their creativity. If I put them in a box too much, I lose that creativity. And in today's world, what businesses want most is the creativity of the people. Each one of you has a, a fantastic power insight. You just need the appropriate leader to unleash this power to whatever you choose to do. Yes, please. Thank you for coming, first of all. Um, I would like to ask you, Seth, that you have worked in many countries. And I'm interested, uh, what do you think, what are the main advantages and disadvantages of Russian people as like, valuable workers? Mm. I only see positives, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, I worked, uh, as I said, in uh, two DNA environment. You understand the term DNA? In business it, becomes, it has become very fashionable, it's called for developing and emerging. 
I work in, in two developing and emerging regions, the one that I'm here, but also the one in Middle East. Both of these environments that I worked, perhaps they don't have the best structures. You have to operate in a little bit of a chaotic situations. But the creativity of people, the energy and the ambition of people far outscores what you see in very structured environments. I had the I had the, also the chance, the opportunity to work in Western uh, environments, in the Netherlands, in, in UK. I can take any Middle Eastern and any Russian over a Westerner anytime if I need to do something. Because I see much more energy and ambition. So if I had to, to select based on nationality, I would select a, nation, a, a Russian national over a Western European. But in order to be able to manage these people, you have to understand them. And that's the key point that I would like to leave with you. So, so we have quite a few expatriates who come here. They never bother to really understand what is the local mentality. And they expect people to follow them. This is not a recipe for success. The recipe for success, in my personal and humble view, is to really try to understand what motivates people and set them free to do the things that you want. And what do you think, what motivates Russian people? <laughs> I think, in my own interpretation, people here are energetic, ambitious, well-educated, perhaps status-driven, uh, and they have a hunger for life. Everybody, anybody can have a different interpretation. That's my view. So I think for, for people who work for me, I, I always try to really share my experience on on the criteria that I use to recruit people for my own team. And that's perhaps my recipe, which so far might have paid off. Criteria number one, high energy levels. Basically, I don't like lazy people. Criteria number two, ambition. And ambition is not where you want to to really reach within the organization, I mean to become CEO. There is only one CEO position in every organization. Not everybody will get, will get there. Ambition to bring things in life from point A to point B. Ambition to do something different every day. Something challenging every day. And the third one, it's a good intellect. But it's not the first one. So based on these three criteria, I selected quite a few people that they had successful careers. They, they continue to have su successful careers. And I aspire to do the same in, in Russia. Have I answered your question? No, there is nothing. Uh, let me answer it um, using a couple of uh, statistics. Two years ago, for our UFLP program, we have uh, managed to hire seven people. In 2009, I think it was 2,000 people. In 2010, it was 16 people. This year, we hired 30 people. And next year, we're going to hire 37 people. But it's interesting also to see how many people apply for that. This year, I think we're going to have close to 10,000 applications. So the rate of success 
it's um, it's very challenging. So out of this theoretically 10,000 people, I think we can find what we want. And as I said during my speech, I believe profoundly about what this country as youth can bring to the party. Otherwise, I wouldn't be working here. And I have explained also the criteria by which I set the recruitment standards. I have an MBA in finance. I never worked in finance. I worked in HR. So even my functional academic qualification didn't, couldn't portray my functional uh, development. So there are no stereotypes. It all depends whether you have it in your heart and in your mind. And most of all, if you had to choose only one, follow your heart. Yes, please. Hi, Mr. Kitsas. Uh, I have a question about the army. So you said that you served uh, the army in Greece, and uh, do you think that it helped you to form your uh, character, that it helped you through your life and maybe career? Do you want an honest answer? <laughs> it, that was a complete waste of my time. I didn't learn anything. Uh, unfortunately, the way the army works today, it doesn't give you the opportunity to develop. I think if uh, the people who run the army in Greece, if they had good ideas how they can contribute in these 18 to two months, two to two years that people spend in the army, they would have got much more. Running the army today, it's not holding a gun. It's about creating intelligence. And they would have utilized all the people who have university degrees in that. But nobody has. So for two years, almost, I was picking up the I was the telephone operator for, for, for a general. <laughs> That's how I spend my time. So gauge yourself how much I learned. Yes, please. Hello, nice to meet you here. My name is Kate. Uh, Mr. Kitz, uh, you've said that uh, everyone can uh, to be a leader. Uh, and from my point of view, I think that uh, there are a lot of people. Uh, some people uh, are leaders from the nature, and uh, some of them are not leaders from the nature. From the nature. And uh, I think that uh, some people, for example, uh, engineers, uh, technical jobs, they can't be a leader. Uh, and can you explain please uh, that everyone in your favor can be a leader? Okay. I will uh, answer that by asking you a question. Can you raise your hand if you believe that in your life so far you have demonstrated leadership so far? Who has demonstrated leadership so far? So I think we have quite a few leaders here. But, but not all of us. Not, because you haven't understood, you haven't realized, to really be more precise, you haven't realized what you led people so far. And why, you, why certain people followed you so far. Leadership, it's not something that you read in the books. We're still discovering, in a, in a sense, the, the definition of leadership. Leadership is about doing everyday action, small actions every day that create a difference in your life, in the lives of your families, in the lives of your friends, in the lives of your colleagues here. I mean, I don't know whether here you work in groups, uh, you, uh, let's say, conduct studies in, in groups, uh, or let's say, uh, you carry out whatever uh, uh, dissertations together. But even with these small groups of two or three people, some people take the lead. And it's not necessary that every, 
always the same people take the same lead. So I think in your life you had experiences, leadership experiences. Perhaps you didn't interpret them in that way. But every day is an opportunity for leadership. And I'd like to leave you with this thought. Okay? Anybody else? Yes, please. Well, sir, thank you a lot for your election. Maybe I'll be a bit pessimistic or a bit realistic, but still I'll do so. Nowadays, the majority of the companies on the market seek for the specialists. And though they all seek for intelligence, for energetic, for ambitions, they are seeking for those who know their job. And you, just a couple of minutes ago, said that the qualification is not the most important for you in the so as far as I understood, your company is sitting for one leaders and through this long period of sorting out seven from ten thousand, you are climbing these one leaders. So you are just sitting for the best? Thank you for the, your question. Let me play back what I think you're saying. We're looking for the best people that we can find. We're looking for people who have a talent and they want to practice leadership in their lives. We want people who want to continue their education whilst working with us. We want people who will make a difference in every day. The professional qualification is something that we look into but it's not the determining factor. I can share with you that in my university studies I was not a very good student because simply I had many, many other interests. But this didn't prevent from me having a good career. So even the academic achievements, it's not a driver for your future success. So we're looking for good people. I think we're differentiating ourselves from competition. We're differentiating enough. We're giving cross-functional experience. And we ask pe people to spend two years of their life working and having fun, but learn at the same time. The people who have this ambition to continue learning and growing and developing, they can join our program. <laughs> yes, please. You don't have to stand up. Uh, thank you for the good presentation. Uh, I've got two questions. The first is about um, how to become a leader, what actions we need to do to become a leader. And second, about uh, making a difference. In Elevaris, uh, our ambitions, company, and uh, take attention to making a difference. What's your last example when you made a difference? There are no, to your first question, there are not le uh, recipes for, for leaders. Because as I said to you, you are leaders. You haven't realized it. And leadership is not the big thing sometimes. There are small things. Small things that make a difference every day. You can lead your family, you can lead your friends, and so forth and so on. Leaders are the people who find the best solutions in uncrafted problems. Leaders are those who have people who are eager to follow them. And I'm sure you had your own experiences during your school years and uni university years. So you will not, you will get a lot of, by reading books about leadership, you will get a lot of examples. People who have stretched themselves to achieve something. This is called leadership. But there is no one recipe for leadership, at least not in my mind. I had the chance to spend um, last two days with, along with my board colleagues in Unilever, Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. And we had an external speaker who said the latest trends about leadership is find the best solutions for ordinary or 
untackled problems and have people follow your solutions. So that's, I think, the boundaries by which you can define leadership and you can live your life leading to what you think is appropriate. As far as I'm concerned, going to the second question, some, somebody may say that even me coming here today, it's a small action that makes a difference. Because some of you may be motivated to come and join Unilever. So I'm spending a couple of hours of my time. You're spending also a couple of hours of your time. It's a small action. May may result to nothing. But it's a worth invest investment for me. Because the future of this country is the future of also of my company. Yesterday, as I said, I spent two full days with, with my board colleagues trying to work out how we become a much more synergetic and efficient team. I put together the two-day plan, that was a small action, may have a huge impact on how this company delivers results in the marketplace. Thank you. Anybody else who is brave enough? Yes. Thank you so much. Hello. And uh, do you believe that being lucky is of vital importance in order to achieve success? And also one more question. Do you believe there's a problem for no, no pain, no gain? Thank you. Okay. Um, who, who plays golf in this, in this uh, auditorium? Is anybody playing golf? No. Okay. I'll take you up for a game. Uh, one of the biggest, the, the, the legendary players uh, in, in, at all times, it's not Tiger Woods, by the way, it's a, a, an old gentleman nowadays called Arnold Palmer, said, the more I practice, the likelier I get. And that's my motto in life. Yeah, circumstances sometimes play to your favor. Being in the right place, in the right time, helps. But perspiration, uh, it's what will make you get there to your aspirations. No pain, no gain. Yes, I do believe that if there is no pain, there is no gain. All the things that I really enjoyed in my life, professionally, but also personally, I had really put a lot of work behind. So I'm a thorough believer that um, if I don't try hard, things won't happen. So I don't like to leave a lot of things at um, random. <laughs> That's it. Oops, another one. Uh, hello, my name is Zim, and can you tell us something about your first uh, work experience when you were a student or a schoolboy? Okay. I started my career at the age of five. Yes, and there is a reason for that. My uh, family had business, and I remember during my uh, sc school breaks in the summer, I always followed my father into the family business, so I was spending initially a couple of hours in his office then we stretch it to three hours, four hours. By the time that I was a teenager, every summer, I used to spend at least one month trying to help. I don't think I added any value most of the time, but uh, I was there attending, attending the business, getting up 5.30 in the morning, a habit that I have up to today. And um, that's how perhaps I learned to appreciate that uh, no pain, no gain. Okay. Hello, I'm Presley from Belarus. You are from Greece. Both these countries are facing great problems nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> and I have such a question. Do you really think that these two countries, Greece and Belarus, are examples of bad leadership? And do you think that the problems or the basis of these problems is in leadership in these countries? or bad, bad accounting. I don't know what is. 
Yeah, I do believe that uh, leadership plays a role. I don't know the specifics about Belarus, but I know the specifics about Greece. And I saw it coming many years ago. So if a country doesn't produce anything, uh, just lives on debt. And we were living on debt since 2002. And the debt was piling up. So it was, a, it was uh, inevitable that one day this, this will happen. So, of course, the people in everyday reality, they didn't realize. Because the banking system flood them with cash or free credit and nothing was painful until the moment that the banks realized hmm, these people may not pay us at the end so they start closing the tap and the same happened with the country so I think yes uh, in, in, my, in my view it's poor leadership don't know about Belarus the specifics but certainly in my country it is the direct product of poor leadership and the, the artificial world that people choose to live. Because some of these people might have understood it much earlier, but they didn't shout out. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, that was not timely, actually. Uh, I'll, I'll share my personal story. It's, um, uh, my father sold the business in 1989. I think much below, just before that you, most of you were born. <laughs> uh, at the time, prior for me leaving for United States to do my MBA. So I had to spend two years for my MBA and two years in the army. And my father, at that point of time, he was 69 years old. So he said, I'm working since I'm 13. Until 69 makes a good 56 years of work. So I will not carry on with the business. So that's how I didn't inherit the family business. Yes, please. Mm. Uh, I have a perfect work-life balance, but each one of you has their own. For me, the perfect work-life balance is work a lot. Because if you love what you're doing, you don't have to work a single day in your life. I love what I'm doing. I love the dichotomy between business and, and people. So for me, spending long hours helping the organization and helping the people, one way or another, giving lectures here, organizing our board away days, or doing much more trivial work, desk office work, gives me utter pleasure because I see every day my contribution. I dedicate a lot of time in my family over the weekend. We have a fantastic family life. We enjoy very much being here. But I also have another love, apart from the house, it's the, the love that I have for the company. And that my commitment to these people, to help this organization and its people to progress in their life. So I'm perfectly balanced with this, that, with this, uh, this, this context. Do I work uh, eight hours a day? No, I don't. But uh, I work as much as I think it's appropriate for me. And if one day, and all, all the people who work for me, they know that, if one day that I don't feel coming to the office, I just don't go to the office. And I said to them, if one day you don't want, or you want to work from home, you work from home. Actually, I had one new management trainee joining me today. Uh, unfortunately, I had to, to ask her to come to the office 7.30. And that was my second meeting of the day. Uh, I don't know whether she, <laughs> she appreciated that, but um, I said to her, look, if um, from time to time you want to work from home, please do. And she was shocked, she says, but we work in the office. I said, no, you work from wherever you want. 
get yourself organized, get yourself a laptop. Get, she was carrying an iPhone, so I said, get your emails in the iPhone, and off you go. You're a mobile worker. So this is my also definition of, uh, of work-life balance. I have all the technology at my av availability to do whatever I, I want to do. I take all my vacations, but during my vacations, since I wake up in any case 5 o'clock in the morning, before my family gets up, I do two hours of email. That's my choice. So what I wanted to say basically is that work-life balance is something very personal. And it has nothing to do with uh, how companies are organized. It has something to do with you, how much you believe in whatever you do. How much you give yourself in, into your everyday action. And if you do something that you love, you don't work. Okay? Yes. Thank you for the lecture. I have a question to you. What's better, uh, from your point of view, to, uh, <clears throat> to run your own business and maybe build a huge company in the future, or to join a huge company like Unilever and something else? It's a very biased answer that you will get from me, because I've made my choice uh, many years ago. Um, look, it depends on your style. And since today we're talking about leadership, I can see leaders, people who join companies, and I can see leaders in people who set their own businesses. For me, the benefit of joining Unilever, I didn't know that I was going to stay in Unilever for about 20 years when I joined. Actually, my dream was to really stay three to five years. I'll learn, I'll continue my education within whilst working, and then I'll move on and do some, something else. And then it becomes like an appetite. I mean, you had more, you had more, people give you the carrot, you take the carrot and you move on. And that's how your life um, uh, flows. So... <laughs> If I had to, to start again, and that's perhaps allow me to really distort your question a little bit. If I, had, if I was in your shoes and I, I was contemplating what I'm going to do, set up my own business or go for a big corporation, I'm tempted to say that I will go for a big corporation because the things that you learn next to people who have good education, good leadership skills, um, good quality human beings, which is an important characteristic, at least in my organization, I think makes me uh, steer myself into working for an organization. That's how I would say. It's a very personal thing, however. What makes you? The entrepreneurs, quite a few times, they are unemployable. Nobody would employ them. You see an entrepreneur, they cannot fit in corporate norms. So it depends what is your personal style. Are you a risk taker, less risk taker? How do you calibrate yourself? Okay? Yes, please. So, 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 your first steps in your career, like uh, HR? Uh, before HR, what I did before HR? Ah, yes. Before HR, I, I started in the future leader programs of Unilever as uh, a procurement assistant. Actually, I was a buyer. I was buying raw material and ingredients for, uh, for a foods factory that we had in Unilever in Greece. And they thought that I was a good fit because I had a... Um, a finance background, so I was good with numbers, uh, and they put me they put me there, and then they moved me to HR. No, it was just I mean it was question to be honest with you to move to HR. I didn't want it. I regret it uh, that um, the HR director at the time said to me, "Come and work for me," uh, and I was intimidated, and I said yes, and that was the best gift that I ever had in my life.
Yes, please. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question about your products. How many new products you are innovating per day, per month, or per week? Uh, I cannot answer that that question. Um, but uh, I'll 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 give it a shot in a different in a different way. We bring every year we bring in the market new products. S the majority of the time these products are extensions to our previous products. So they are what we called renovations other than innovations. So we change the label, we change the packaging, we we change the formulations and these products just to really stimulate always consumer interest. From time to time, we bring to the market breakthrough ideas. And at a global level, we have very successful innovations hitting in the different markets. Last week, I was attending a global conference with a top 400 managers in, in Unilever, leaders in Unilever. And I have seen all the innovation pipeline, which will come in 2012 and to 2013. So that was a thrilling experience for me, especially when we're talking about ice cream. So I tested all the ice cream that will hit the market in 2012 and 2013. So imagine how happy I was. <laughs> uh, so I cannot really quantify the number. But I know from the plans that we, we discuss in the board that there is a lot of activity happening. Uh, so, but I cannot really give you a specific uh, number. If, however, re required to stay close to our consumers, we have to do that often. Because the question that I'm going to ask you, not for an answer, but for reflection, it's how often you're getting bored from a product and you change to something else. Personally, quite often. So if I don't provoke you as a company with my products, with my brands, I will lose you as a consumer. So I have to really bring something new to keep the interest of the consumer high. Sorry, I cannot be a bit more specific. Yes, please. I can tell you about internship, or I will ask my colleague to come and tell you uh, more about internship. Uh, but it's a program that we thoroughly believe in. Um, we bring interns twice a year for about three months uh, each time. And uh, our ambition is that quite a few of these interns join also the Future Leaders Program. So because they will get the exposure, the experience, and we see them every day. And some of these people, actually, one of the trainees who worked for me, last year was an intern. She went to UK, finished her uh, master's degree, or I think bachelor's degree, and then uh, she came back and she got a job for, for us. So we have many examples of people who have successfully finished an internship program, uh, and um, uh, they moved back to, to us. But if you want more specific things about the internship program, Irina here will uh, connect with Irina and she will give you all the information that, that you need. Thank you, Matt. Just one question. Is it full-time or part-time? I think it's full-time. But it's a, for a short period of time. It's about three months. It's uh, for the summer and three months in the winter. Yes, please. Thank you. Advantages and disadvantages, you mean my strengths and areas for development? Uh, as a leader, of course. Yeah. I have lots. Uh, and the other thing that you said? Uh, the failure in your life, in the business failure. Like. Biller, business failure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's a very good question. Um, my strengths lie on my professional expertise. I think uh, what people recognize in me is that I know the arena of HR very well and I bring a lot of value into the things that uh, uh, I've, I've been doing here since I landed in, uh, in Moscow. 
Also from a behavioral point of view, I'm somebody who has courage, determination, drive, and I have a growth mindset. I like to really do new things, stretch myself and others into new opportunities. As far as for the areas for development, I'm a very stubborn person. When I get something in my mind, it will happen. So, and of course, this is sometimes is a little bit annoying for the others, I recognize. Also, sometimes I, because as a person I'm a bit shy, I don't open up easily to, to people. And that's something that I'm working on. Failures, well, every day I can name one. Uh, because the only people who don't fail are the people who don't try anything. So, I would, I would say that um, perhaps one failure that I have, it's, but it's not in a sense a failure, but it's something, a, a, a difficult period in my life which made me reflect a lot, is when I left Unilever, uh, the reasons for which I left Unilever, uh, and how this has happened. There, there is a lot of learning for me what I wouldn't have, I would have done differently. Uh, but failures, small failures every day, at least one. I'm sure you, you match that record. Everybody here matches that record. And failures and mistakes, and I talked about mistakes. Failures and mistakes is a fantastic opportunity for you to learn something new every day. As long as you reflect why something happened and it doesn't go unnoticed. If it goes unnoticed, it will be, never become a learning opportunity. So I have a habit, uh, and I'm stretching your, your answer. Uh, I have a habit, and I do that religiously ever since I started working. When I finish my working day and I go home, I spend five or ten minutes every day thinking what I could have done differently. And for me, that's the most uh, productive part of the day because it results to many other opportunities for the days to come. Did I answer your question? Thank you. <clears throat> I see you up. Oh, there is another one. I was going to say everybody dried up from questions. It's a good question. Um, look, ambition has different um, angles. You can see ambition from different angles. As I said before, it's not ambition is not about becoming CEO or functional leader. Ambition is to really do things, take things from point A and reach them to point B. People want to do things in their life. One core value of, of Unilever is is working and respect each other, working within our environment and respecting each other. So you will see very rarely people succeeding in Unilever if they don't embrace these, these values. So it's not become being, being ambitious for yourself, but channel your ambition that you have for yourself for the benefit of the team. And this becomes a totally different um, a ball game. This is the power of sharing. Oh, part of the team. I mean, I didn't talk about Unilever that much today. I mean, uh, I can give you the what are the core four values of Unilever. First of all, is integrity. We conduct business with integrity in whatever we do. Second is we are responsible citizens of the world. We have responsibility through our products, through our business contact, through the respect that we have in the environment. The third is respect. Respect for our employees, 
for our suppliers, for our customers, for our consumers, for our stakeholders. And the fourth is being, being pioneering, trying things for the first time, demonstrating leadership and ambition to go from point A to point B as an organization every day. So that is what makes this organization very special in my view. Yes, please. Being 47 years old, my memory fails because it must have been in my school years, leading a team. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I always had this bug. I wanted to lead uh, groups of people to achievements from early on. So I tried in a number of occasions to be the football leader in my uh, team in the school. Uh, I was elected as, as a president of my class in, in the high school. Uh, I was the leader of a basketball team playing uh, during my, my university years. I had many, many of those that I always tried to really participate in. And leadership early, early in your career, it's about showing active participation. It's not bec the becoming the person who calls the shots. It's but becoming the person who people around gather to achieve something together. And in that sense, this must have happened early on in my career, but I don't remember the specific incidents. But there are plenty that I recall as a vague, uh, uh, let's say, incidents of my life. Uh, I speak Greek, I speak English, I used to speak French, I studied French for seven years, now I haven't spoken for about 30, so if you say something to f in French to me, I must say that I have forgotten. And I'm learning Russian. Um, and I'm learning Russian once a week, I take lessons. I have a, a teacher who comes and gives uh, private lessons to, to me. So if you speak very slowly, I will understand. But I don't have the guts to speak. Ja ne govori u paruški. Another hand. Yes, please. Uh, what decisions were the most important in your life? A couple of them. First of all, to get married. <laughs> and why I'm saying that? Because family stability is very important. I think I need a partner, uh, somebody who will support me in the difficult decisions of, of, of my life. And that's what is, is my, my wife. Second, a, a difficult decision that I have taken is that I left, when I left Unilever, very difficult decision. It was done for personal reasons, but it was a very difficult decision to, to take. And the one that even today makes me have second thoughts as I shared uh, before. The difficult decision was to really convince my family to go to, to London or even to come to Russia. Although we enjoy being here, but moving houses in five years, three times, moving countries, it's, it's a challenging uh, decision uh, that uh, creates instability in, in family uh, uh, balance. Um, also difficult decisions associated with uh, firing people. It's part of my role. Don't enjoy doing it, but from time to time I have to do it. So I would say as a leader, as a manager, you have to take tough calls on an everyday basis. Um, have I shied away from difficult decisions in my life, which could be another question? Yes, many times. So difficult decisions make us 
feel so small. But if we have to do it, we need to put our strength to dig together and make it happen. Happen, and this is called leadership as well. Huh? On your first question, I, I let if you can please repeat it because uh, I, I need to understand. Okay. Um, what do you think about uh, conditions uh, and some of the changes for young people in Russia with new ide ideas who want to start uh, their own business? Their? Their own business. Their own business. Okay. I'm not an expert, to, to be honest with you, but I will t tell you a few macro uh, data. I mean, Russia, it's a, it's a brick country. Do you all know what is a brick country? That's good. That's good. So, brick countries in the DNA world, and I'm using corporate jargon now, brick countries in the DNA world, um, I think are destined to continue to have aggressive growth for the years to come. Of course, the global financial crisis slowed them down, but if you really take uh, a backward projection of the last uh, 20 years, I think Russia has achieved a lot. And I think it will co continue to achieve a lot. It's a big market. The per capita, GDP per capita will continue the house, uh, to, to grow. The average uh, earnings per, per household will continue to grow. And this will generate more opportunities for big companies to come and, and, and operate out of Russia and for young entrepreneurs who want to try their own thing to really have these opportunities. So I, I am a firm believer that Russia will present a lot of good opportunities for the next uh, 10 to 20 years for sure. And key there is the quality of the education that you get because education will be the springboard to achieve your, your personal objectives. For the second level of your question, I'm not a politician. Um, I think uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal change that this country has achieved the last 20 years, if you compare it with the previous history. Can you do more? Absolutely. Everything is an opportunity. Can you do things differently? Yes. But when you are the leader, you have to take some calls, considering also what is the environment. And I think in my view, Russia has done extremely well the last uh, 20 years, with ups and downs. So I'm going to disappoint you because my political uh, backstage is pretty, pretty weak, so I'm not going to give you any any more, um, uh, let's say, enlightened insights. But I think um, Russia is doing well. And I think that's what you should take out of that. Can I add something about some questions? Sure. Um, okay. What do you think about uh, economical prisoners in Russia? I have no clue about that. And I, I will not answer any political questions. Exactly. What about the Kazlov and the I'm not here standing for any politician. <laughs> but I'm, no, I'm not polite. I'm, I'm just ignorant. I just happen, don't, don't know. Don't know. Shame on me that I don't know, but I don't know. The role of a leader also to accept is what he or she doesn't know. There is no one recipe. Uh, what I do is ensure that I have all the facts that I can make a decision. 
so firing people, it's, it's a, not an easy task because you deal with people's life. So you have to be absolutely uh, careful with that. Um, I would say you gather all the facts, you really be very clear, have a clear objective why this person has to be fired, either for bad performance or for, for their role being, um, let's say, discontinued, uh, cancelled, and do your homework and go to the person and speak in a very humane way uh, why this, this person doesn't fit in the organization any longer and do it that with respect. And that's something that I learned in my organization, to do these type of things with a lot of respect. I mean, is, is Unilever organization that has fired people before? Yes, absolutely, and will continue to do it. But it all depends how you do it. There are organizations who don't really uh, do it in a humane and respecting uh, way for the individual. I have been, uh, I have learned how to do it, uh, that when even people leave, I would say nine of the 10 people who leave Unilever they are willing to come back to Unilever. Uh, and they still speak about Unilever with very good words, and they are still consumers of the organization. And for me, this is emphatic of the situation. So you deliver a difficult message to a person, but the person still respects you from who, what, what you are. They are not recipes. And I think, for me, this is the best recipe. Do it in a way that the other person understands where you come from when this difficult moment has to be reached. Okay. I think you dried up. All right, then we'll stop it here. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Your presence here, attention, and of course the questions which make me learn and stimulate myself. So I may come back. Bye.